Hello, everyone. I apologize for the delay. We were having some technical issues on our computer. If you give me just one moment, I'm going to mute the audio on our second computer and I'll get ready to start the program. All right, thank you for your patience, everyone. I really appreciate that. Well, welcome to the Virginia Living Museum. My name is Emily, I'm an educator here, and you guys are here for a program called Legends and Lore. So I hope you guys are ready to meet some cool animal ambassadors and learn a little bit about some myths and some legends, especially associated with animals right around this time of year. Now throughout the program, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the question and answer box and I will happily answer them. So feel free to post a question at any time. All right, let's get this program started. So first, what I want to mention is that this time of year, a lot of people refer to it as spooky season. And that's because Halloween is right around the corner. And Halloween comes with lots of stories and tales of old. And a lot of these stories incorporate animals. So when you think of Halloween, what are some animals you commonly associate with it? So when I think of it, I think of things like black cats. I think of spiders. I think of lizards and snakes and frogs and toads and all of these animals are really cool and unique to see in the wild, but they also have a lot of kind of myths and legends around them, specifically around Halloween time. So the first animal I'd like to introduce you to is an animal that is commonly associated with witches. This one is commonly in witches' brews and potions and things like that. Any guesses? If you're thinking about a frog, you're absolutely correct. So there's a lot of myths and legends around frogs being parts of potions and spells and stuff because a frog is an amphibian and being an amphibian means you have a layer of moisture around your skin and that moisture was believed to have magical powers. So if you added that to your uh, brews and your stews, it would actually help keep you healthy. It helped remove warts, it helped reduce ailments, and it actually was supposed to help you just feel better in general. So frogs were commonly used because of that mucus layer was believed to have magical healing properties. Isn't that cool? Now, I don't suggest licking frogs. However, they do indeed have a little mucus. All right, let me get them out for you. And here we have an American bullfrog. Let's get a close up of her face. There we go. So, this is an American bullfrog. They are one of the largest species of frogs here in Virginia. And, like I mentioned, they kind of look very wet. That's not only because she's in water right now, but that is a protective outer layer for amphibians. So, an amphibian means that you spend part of your life in the water and part of your life on land. So frogs, let me turn her around again, start their life in the water. So they start their life as a tadpole. Here we go. And as they grow up, they grow through something. Oh, she doesn't want to stay still today. She's a little camera shy. And as they grow up, they become an adult frog that can now live on land. So that's what it means to be an amphibian. Now, some other cool adaptations that she has is, whoop, she's got a lot of her things to help her swim. So you notice that she's got some water in here. 
but she also has webbed toes that help her to swim. And she also has eyes located on the top of her head. So you see how those eyes are sitting on top of her head instead of in her head, kind of like you and I. Oh, where are we going there, my friend? There we go. We're going to calm down for a second. We're a little jumpy today. There we go. And so those eyes help her to see while her body is completely submerged in the water. So she's really good at swimming and she's really good at jumping, which you guys have just been able to see. And that helps her to escape from predators. So she's pretty quick on her feet. She swims really good in the water, but then also jumps on land very well. She is a carnivore, which means that she only eats meat. So she's gonna eat bugs. She can eat small lizards. She can eat other small frogs as well, as long as it can fit in that big old bullfrog mouth of hers. So right there, that's her mouth. And that's where she eats all of that food. So she can gulp it down in one big old bite because frogs, they don't have any teeth whatsoever. Do you guys have any questions about the bullfrog? I don't see any questions popped up yet, but like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to open up that question and answer box and I will happily answer them throughout the program. Alrighty, if there's no questions about the bullfrog, we're gonna go ahead and put her down. Oh, I see, I see a question here in the chat. It says, are females bigger than the males? Um, so when it comes to bullfrogs, yes, the females tend to be a little bit bigger, but not significantly bigger. The best way to tell whether you're looking at a female or a male is by looking at its ear. So its ear is a little disc right behind its eye. And if it has a big ear, if the ear is bigger than the eye, then it's going to be a guy. It's going to be a boy. However, if the ear is a little bit smaller or about the same size as the eye, then you're looking at a girl frog. So that's the way you're gonna be able to tell the difference between a boy and a girl bullfrog. Any other questions? Good questions. All right, then we're gonna move on to our next animal. And our next animal is one of my personal favorite animals. I had to see which container I was gonna pick up next here. So this animal also associated with Halloween, and you guys might use one of its adaptations to decorate your house for Halloween. Does anybody like to spread cobwebs and spider webs to make your house look spooky and old? That's right. Our next animal is going to be a type of spider. And spiders have a really cool history also associated with witches, similar to that of the bullfrogs. Actually, I see a bullfrog question. Let me answer that real quick before we get more into our spider stuff. And the question is, how old do bullfrogs get? Uh, bullfrogs don't live to be very old. Most amphibians don't. I would say max about five years, um, but they don't live to be a very long amphibian. But that's an excellent question. All right. So moving forward, we're now going to talk about spiders. And spiders have a very cool story. So spiders were known to live in really close relationship with witches because what spiders would do is they would hide in the folds of a witch's cloak. So think of like that cape or the cloak you typically picture an old timey witch with. And the spider would hold or hide in the folds and then whisper secrets and spells and stuff to the witches and give them advice on what to do. So a lot of people picture owls as like the wise animal, but actually with a lot of Halloween stuff, it's spiders. It's spiders that would whisper the secrets of life to the witches and stuff. So I thought that was a pretty cool folklore. Now, this spider I have is a specific type of spider. It is called a tarantula. You guys ready to meet our animal ambassador? Oh, I bet you guys are. Here we go. And here we have one of our tarantulas. So a tarantula is a larger type of spider. They're in the arachnid family, which means they have two body parts. So they've got here, which is their pseudothorax, and then their abdomen, which is back here. And then they have eight legs. 
And let's see if we can get a nice good look at her face. Here we go. And up front, she's got these two little legs. They look like legs, but they have a special name. You wanna hear your fun science word? These guys are called pedipalps. And they're not true legs, but what they are is extensions to help bring food to their mouth. And their mouth does have fangs on them. And the fangs are what they use to eat their food. So they are carnivores, similar to that bullfrog. They eat only meat and they use their fangs to inject a venom, which basically turns that animal into a nice smoothie. Anybody else want to eat a bug smoothie? Just me? Okay, I'm a little weird. That's okay. But yes, that's what a tarantula is going to do. They're going to use these petty palps up front to move food towards their mouth, which is their fang, so that they can slurp up that slushy. Now, like I mentioned, in Halloween lore, there's also all that cobwebs and stuff that um, spiders make, which is their home to catch their food. Now, she has spinnerets, which are at the very back of her abdomen, but she's not a true web maker. She's not gonna really make a big web. She might make a little bit of one, but she's a ground-dwelling uh, tarantula. And what she does instead is she's a pouncer. So what she'll do is she'll wait typically behind a log or a rock. She'll find a really good hiding spot. And when she finds something juicy, like a nice big cricket, she'll pounce out and she'll grab it and then bite it. So rather than waiting for something like a fly to fly into the stickiness of a spider's web, she's going to actually actively hunt for food. So she's a little bit different than what you think of like your house spiders, your orb weavers, things like that. And then another cool defense that she has is if we take a really close look at her, you'll notice that she kind of looks hairy. Now, hair is a true characteristic of mammals. She's definitely not a mammal. She's not a furry animal, but those hairs are made of a type of protein and they're irritating. So what happens is if something bigger comes along that might want to make her a nice little snack, she can actually release these hairs and they cause a rash or irritation on that animal, hopefully scaring them away. So these aren't true hairs, but they do make her look a little bit hairy, like she's a little bit fuzzy there. And it's her main form of defense. So while she has those big fangs in order to attack and make sure that she has a healthy snack, those hairs help protect her from bigger things to make sure she doesn't become a big healthy snack. Does anybody have any questions about our tarantula? Now, for any of you guys that aren't a big fan of tarantulas here, don't worry, this one is not native to North America. So this one is def this one is native to South America instead. I see we have a question. It says, are all tarantulas ground hunters? That's an excellent question. No, not all of them are. Actually, a lot of them like to also hunt in trees and we'll get into bird's nests as well. Um, some of them hunt on the ground. Some of them make tunnels. So some of them are what's called trapdoor spiders. And so what they'll do is they'll dig a hole in the ground and they'll trap animals down in that hole and then they'll go and they'll eat them in there. So it's on the ground, but it's kind of a different level of things. So no, not all tarantulas just hunt on the ground. That is a fantastic question. Any other questions? Good thinking questions. I like it when people make me think hard in the morning. All right, if there's no other questions, we're gonna talk some more spooky tales about Halloween animals here. And so the next animal I have has quite the opposite amount of legs as this spider. So the spider was an arachnid, two body parts, eight legs. Let's think of a Halloween animal that maybe has no legs at all. That sounds kind of weird. What in the world could that be? Hmm, how about a snake? Yes, so snakes for Halloween lore used to be the tricksters. So everybody, when you go knocking on door to door for Halloween, you would say, trick or treat. Well, the serpents or the snakes would be the tricksters. So watch out for snakes on Halloween because they just might take your candy. <gasps> except snakes don't eat candy, do they? No. And this one is not so tricky. This one's one of my favorites. He's a cute little guy. Let's meet our next animal ambassador. 
And this guy is a Western hognose snake. There we go. And he's saying hi to you guys by sticking out his tongue right there. And he's called a hognose. Let's see if we could turn his face a little bit. Oh, there we go. Do you see how his nose is kind of upturned? So it's upturned kind of like a pig's snout. But that uh, snout is good for digging. And this guy is a carnivore. So we're sticking to that carnivore theme going on today. But what he really likes to eat is frogs. Isn't that weird? Most people, when they think of snakes, they think of eating bugs or small rodents and things like this. No, this guy is really good at eating frogs and toads. So when a frog or a toad gets scared, their way of defending themselves not only is hopping away, but they bloat themselves. They get nice and big like this. So they're not easy to eat, right? However, these guys have a special set of fangs that is meant for popping toads and frogs. Isn't that cool? So this guy has a special adaptation in order to eat those guys. Now, this guy is a reptile. So a reptile means that he is a cold-blooded animal that is covered in scales. So first, to determine what cold-blooded means, go ahead and take your hand and put it next to your cheek. Is your cheek nice and warm right now? Well, I hope it is. I hope you guys are warm and cozy today. And that's because you and I are warm blooded. So we stay warm all year round. We like to stay right at about the same temperature. If we go too high, that's a fever. If we go too low, that's hypothermia. But these guys being cold blooded, they live in a wider range of temperature. So they're comfortable fluctuating a little bit more than us. But it also means that they need to get their heat from somewhere else. You and I, we get most of our energy and our heat from the food that we eat. Not the same for these guys. So a lot of times you'll see reptiles do something called basking, which is sitting in the sun and taking in the sun's energy. So if you've ever seen a snake or a, or a turtle just kind of sitting on a log or a rock being really still, chances are that's what they're doing. They're taking in the sun's energy to stay nice and warm. And another thing is all of the scales. You see the beautiful scales we have here? And so those scales help them keep their heat in and help protect them as well. And if you're curious as to what a scale feels like, take one of your pointer fingers, take your pointer finger, and touch any one of your fingernails. When you touch your fingernail, you're touching the same thing that a snake's scales are made of. You're touching keratin, which is a protein that our hair and our fingernails nails are made of. And it's the same thing that makes up this snake scales. And one other really cool adaptation they have, he's doing a great job here, is sticking that tongue in and out. So everybody see that tongue? There we go. So his tongue is doing something really special. You and I, in order for us to smell the world around us, we use our nose. However, a snake does have a nose. Let's check out that nose again. There we go, right in front of his face. However, his nose is just for breathing. It's not for smelling. His actual nose is located inside of his mouth on the roof of its mouth. So take your tongue and touch the top of your mouth. That is where a snake's nose is. And in order for him to smell, he's got to keep sticking his tongue out. So he's smelling my hand right now because that's where he is. And he sticks his tongue out, flicks it around, sticks it back in and touches the top of his mouth. And that's how he smells. And a snake's tongue is in a really cool shape. Now his tongue's moving kind of fast, but you still might be able to see that at the very end, it's forked like this. So it's not a flat tongue like you and I have, it kind of has this V-like shape. And this V shape helps tell the direction of where the animal he's going to want to eat is located. So think about it this way. If there is a smell of an animal he wants to eat this way, this side of the tongue is going to smell it. Mmm, delicious. But if there's something that smells good this way, this side of the tongue is going to smell it. So he's going to move this way. So he uses it as a directional piece in order to help him best find his food. So snakes have lots of cool adaptations to help them survive in the wild. Do you guys have any questions about the snake?
You guys are asking some really good questions so far. So I'd love to hear if you have any more. No, doesn't look like it for now. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and put our snake away. And we're gonna talk about one more cool spooky animal for Halloween. And this one is our very iconic owls. So a lot of people think of owls for Halloween because they're a nocturnal animal. Oop, I got one more question. How big of a frog can he eat? So this refers to the snake. Excellent question. So snakes can actually eat things that are significantly bigger than their head. And the reason they can do that is because of their jaw. So if you take your pointer fingers and you stick them right next to your ear, so right in front of your ear right here, and you open and close your mouth like this, you'll feel the joint that's in your, in your jaw. So you and I as humans, that's the only joint that we have. If you were a snake, bring your fingers down to the side of your chin, you'd have another joint down here. And then right here in the middle of your chin, you would also have a uh, space. You would have like a, a tendon, you'd have connective tissue here. So your whole jaw could open twice as wide this way and side to side. So you can typically eat things over four to five times bigger than your actual head. So that's a pretty big frog that he can eat. Could he eat that American bullfrog? No, that bullfrog is way too big, but definitely smaller frogs, tree frogs, other ground frogs like that they could absolutely eat. All right, now let's talk about the owl's legend and lore. So owls being that nocturnal animal, so that means active during the nighttime, you commonly see them for Halloween because that's when we're out trick-or-treating. Now the legend goes, if you see an owl fly in the night and it lands on the roof of a house, that house has a ghost in it. So apparently ghosts can make animal friends in the afterlife. And what they typically do is they make friends with an owl. So owls are indicative of if a house has a ghost in it. So when you're out trick or treating, take a look around your neighborhood and see if you see any owl sitting on the roof of a house because chances are there just might be a ghost inside. Now, again, these are just stories. These are just myths and legends. Um, I don't think there's a scientific way for me to prove that. However, I think you guys might want to meet our next and our final animal ambassador, which is an Eastern Screech Owl. Give me one moment to go ahead and get her. There we go. There we go. I'm gonna sit on my glove. Oh, good job, good job. Here we are. So this here is our Eastern Screech Owl. This is Ollie. And this is a native owl to Virginia, so you can definitely see them around here. And Ollie is a nocturnal animal, so again, active during the nighttime. And just like all of the other animals that we saw today, Ollie too is a carnivore. So again, only eats meat, has a nice curved beak in order to eat things like bugs and small rodents and things like that. However, the beak is not what they use in order to catch their prey. What they use is these talons. So talons are similar to like a mammal's claws and they're used to fly down, swoop and grab its prey. So it's those talons that you want to be wary of, not so much the beak there. Now, owls have wonderful eyesight. So that's the number one sense they're going to use in order to navigate through the nighttime sky. So their eyes can not only see in the visible light spectrum, which is what you and I can see in, but they can also see in the UV light spectrum, which means ultraviolet. So for these guys, it means they can see things that glow in the dark. Wouldn't that be a cool adaptation to have? We'd have some really neat night vision. They also have really good hearing as well. So you and I, our ears are located pretty equal on our face, right? They're pretty even. If you were an owl, you'd have, you would have ears that are located in different positions on your face. So one would kind of be up here and a little bit further forward, and one would be down and a little further back. And that's because these guys don't have a true ear like you and I do to funnel in the sound. 
So that's what this part of our ear is for. It acts like a big old funnel so that we can hear sounds better. Owls don't have that. They just have holes in the side of their head. So by being located in two different positions, it helps them hear things significantly better. Their hearing is actually way better than your hearing and my hearing. Now with this good sense of hearing and with these strong talons and good eyes, how are they able to catch their prey at night? Well, they're able to do that by having silent feathers. So their feathers, when they actually flap their wings, allow them to have very quiet flight. So they're really sneaky and they're able to fly up on their prey without being detected. I see we have a question. The question is, how well do owls see colors in the visible light spectrum? So they see the same colors that you and I do. I am unsure whether they can see more colors. So there are some animals that can see stronger in the visible light spectrum. So if you think of something like a mantid shrimp, they have like double the amount of cones and rods in their eyes than you and I do. So they can see colors that you and I can't even detect. Um, as far as I'm aware, they can see about equally as good as us in the visible light spectrum. They just have the added benefit of also being able to see in the UV light spectrum. Fantastic question. Good question, guys. And again, if you have any more questions, feel free to add them to the chat or to the question and answer box as well. Um, some other cool things is so Ollie here has these little tufts of feathers and a lot of people mistake them for ears. However, like I mentioned, that's not where her ears are located at all. So they're just tufts of feathers. They're kind of, we're still learning what exactly they're used for. Some people believe they're used kind of like a dog's ears to detect emotion. So they stand up straight when they're kind of on high alert. And then they're uh, pushed back when they're more relaxed and things like that. Uh, but we're still studying that just a little bit more. And Oh, I was gonna say something else and then it just left my brain. Give me one moment to think about that. What was I gonna say about this beautiful animal here? I don't remember, but if you have more questions, maybe it'll jog my memory about what I was about to share next. Yeah. Oh, uh, what I was gonna share is the number one thing that people ask me all the time is, can animals turn their head all the way around? Well, the answer is yes and no. So can they turn their head from directly in front of them to directly behind them? Absolutely. But can they go in a complete circle? No, because what would happen is their head would just pop off. <laughs> so they need to be able to have a supported um, vertebrae in their neck in order for them to turn that far, but they can't go a complete 360. So the reason that an owl can do that is because they have twice as many bones in their neck than you and I do. So you and I, we have seven bones in our neck, which allows us to turn our head so our chin comfortably kind of touches our shoulder, but they can go twice as far because they have 14 bones in their neck. So their bones are smaller, they have more joints, which allows them to turn their head that much further than you and I do. And Ollie's doing an excellent example of that, almost turning our head completely around. There we go. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and put our last animal ambassador back and let me wrap up this program. There we go. Good bird. All right, so I hope you guys enjoy spooky season as much as I do and take a chance to go to your local library and look up a book about different myths and legends surrounding uh, Halloween. Halloween's got a rich history, especially with things relating to animals and animals that we have right here in Virginia. I will happily stay on for the next few minutes to answer any questions, especially because we started the program late, so my apologies there for that. Um, but otherwise, I want to thank everybody for joining us for asking fantastic questions. You guys did a great job today. And if you have any other questions relating to animals, Halloween, the Virginia Living Museum, I'd love to stick around for the next minute or two and answer them for you. Oh, I see somebody said thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Any other questions? Oh, I see another great program. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
All right, if I see no other questions pop up, I'm going to go ahead and again, thank you guys so much for spending your time here with us today and have a great rest of your day.